questions swirling around here. There's a woman, Brianna Hendricks, who gave an interview with an NBC affiliate. We can't show the video because we don't own it, but this is what she said. There was a lady who pushed her way forward into the concert venue, into the first row, and started mess messing with another lady and told us we were all going to die tonight. The reporter says, do you know why she was saying that? Was this after the shots were fired? And Brianna says, it was about 45 minutes before... September 25th, 2017, security camera footage captures Stephen Paddock arriving at the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino six days before the attack. He's a high roller, a regular at the hotel. He was a very typical guest. He was, in our estimation, the lowest risk type of individual. No alarm bells going off. Paddock checks into a suite on the 32nd floor, and he's given the VIP treatment, allowed to bring his luggage up through a service elevator. Over the course of his stay, he makes several trips to his house in Mesquite, Nevada, and brings in case after case after case of luggage. 21 suitcases in all, full of guns and ammunition. The investigation shows on October 1st, he orders room service and rigs surveillance cameras before he brings in a final batch of suitcases and locks himself in his room. That night at 9.40 p.m., Mandalay Bay security officer Jesus Campos is on a routine security check assigned to a room alarm on the 32nd floor. This was the last call of my night. You were heading home in your head. In my head, I was home free after this. He has no idea he's about to become an accidental hero on what would become one of the most horrific nights in American history. As shown in this rendering provided exclusively to ABC News by MGM, once on the 30th floor, he takes the stairs up to the 32nd, but he finds the exit door jammed. So he walks up to the elevator and takes it back down. When did something seem off to you? Uh, when I noticed the metal L bracket that was secured, that hold the door secured. That bracket, strategically placed there by a man staying in the suite just a few feet away. I didn't know what was going on, just simply because that's not normal. I had to call our security dispatch. I was transferred to engineering dispatch. As he walks back into the hallway to check that room alarm, turns out a nanny a few doors down left their door ajar. He hears a strange noise coming from the suite. Thought it was drill noises. The massacre has just begun. The massacre has just begun.
is frozen in fear inside the Mandalay Bay Hotel as the Las Vegas massacre unfolds. The gunman is firing from inside his hotel suite on the 32nd floor, but Officer Cordell Hendricks on the floor below makes no effort to bring the bad guy down. Now he is being branded a coward and fired. Police union leaders are coming to his defense, saying he did nothing wrong. They want him reinstated. What is that like for him to be branded a coward and be fired for it? For any police officer, that's a horrible uh, statement to make. Cordell was one of the first people to get up there, uh, was on the 31st floor. A coward would have went the other way. Officer Hendricks was with a female rookie on her first day on the job and three armed hotel security guards. They can hear the gunfire and radio broadcasts about the mayhem taking place outside the hotel. They know the shooter, Stephen Paddock, is firing from the floor above. Hendricks told investigators, I remember being terrified with fear, and I think that I froze right there in the middle of the hall. For how long, I can't say. The video establishes that he remained in place for four and a half minutes. Then Hendricks finally advances to the stairwell, leading to the floor where the shooter is. But he never goes all the way up the stairs. We need your truck. We just need to get people over to the hospital, okay? A passing SUV was commandeered to take some of the wounded to the hospital. You can see victims with gunshot wounds being carried on fencing used as makeshift stretchers. The deadly rain of bullets continued for four and a half Dramatic police radio broadcasts show how a SWAT team closed in on the gunman on the 32nd floor of the hotel. I'm inside the Mandalay Bay on the 31st floor. I can hear the automatic fire coming from one floor ahead. One floor above us. We're coming out on the 32nd floor. Just about to off the bridge, bridge, bridge. There's one down, 32nd floor, Mandalay Bay. You can see two blown-out windows in the corner suite where the gunman made his nest. The windows don't open, so he smashed them with a hammer.
deadliest mass shooting in American history. More than 50 dead, more than 200 injured after a gunman named Stephen Paddock uh, started to fire on the Route 91 Country Music Festival in Las Vegas from the Mandalay Bay Hotel at around 10.08 p.m. Uh, Las Vegas time. Brian Ross, our chief investigative correspondent, as we look at the scene right there, a lot Okay, you're listening to some information coming in, obviously, as it's being developed from New York based on what's happening in Las Vegas, where we now know at least 50 people have have been killed in excess of 50 people is what we just heard from the sheriff's office and at least 200 people in fact in excess more than 200 people hurt update on the situation as I know it at this point. I think it's very important for you to understand that this investigation is going to be long and contracted um, before we get to the bottom of everything associated with it. Uh, but it's one of the things I wanted to update you with is we have located the vehicles that I had put out in the first briefing and we believe we were confident but not 100% sure we have located the female person of interest. Uh, so I want the people to feel confident and calm in that aspect that we've uh, accomplished a lot in a short period of time. Now the number of injuries I do not know yet um, but we are looking in an excess of 50 uh, individuals dead and over 200 individuals injured at this point. I do not want to give you an accurate number and it be wrong uh, so subsequently Consequently, um, that is why I'm portraying it in that um, manner. Now, the suspect, uh, I am going to provide you his identity at this point. His name is Stephen Paddock. Um, last name spelled P-A-D-D-O-C-K, uh, with the date of birth of 4-9 of 1953. Um, as far as his, as his history and background, uh, we haven't completed that part of the investigation yet, um, but we located numerous firearms within the room that he occupied, and that's, like I uh, stated earlier, it's going to be a long and tedious um, investigation. Now, we're bringing in all the resources of the FBI to assist us in this investigation, um, in particular to their victim witness advocates and their CSI folks to help us process the scene and ensure that that we're getting all the evidence that we can possibly uh, uh, obtain. Now, 
Now, furthermore, I want to provide you the phone number that I said I would provide in the first briefing. That number for family and friends uh, to get an update on loved ones is 1-866-535-5655. One more time, 1-866-535-5654. Um, obviously, this is a tragic incident and one that we've never experienced in this valley. Um, so what we're going to try to do is the best we can to get our first responders back on their feet and responding and conducting a proper investigation and ensure that we have the safety of this community at heart. Uh, wife or companion was not in the United States at the time. Uh, has she returned to the United States? Do we know anything about any contact that authorities may have had with her? Well, we understand that authorities have spoken to her and that she was out of the country um, and they, you know, they don't believe uh, that she was involved in this and they ha have been in contact with her uh, at this time, but it, it's our understanding that she was not in the country. I'm Dina Titus. I represent uh, Nevada's first district, which includes the fabulous Las Vegas Strip and the scene of this horrendous act. So many times I have welcomed people to Las Vegas conventions or special events, never imagined that I would be standing in here trying to offer solace and service to those who would be harmed or killed by such an, such an act. Uh, my office is serving as a clearinghouse. We don't want to get in the way of this wonderful law enforcement and first responders who have done such a good job, but we want to be there in any way we can. We've gotten many, many phone calls into the office from people around the country looking to find out where their folks are, were they hurt or in the hospital, were they killed. We're trying to pass that information on to the appropriate place. A couple of immigration calls that we're trying to, to help with as well. I would point out in addition to the, to the services that have already been mentioned, uh, Thomas and Mac opened up for, as a temporary refuge for people who were put out of their hotel rooms. The Clark County School District has offered its counselors to the public if they are needed. We were contacted by Airbnb. They are all also offering facilities to anybody who needs to come into town to uh, to see about family members. The Las Vegas massacre has left many questions. Conspiracy theories are running wild. Here to break them down is retired lieutenant of the Las Vegas Police Department and host of Blue Lives Radio, Randy Sutton. So, Randy, I'm going to start with the first one that's been swirling around here. Is a woman, Brianna Hendricks, who gave an interview with an NBC affiliate. We can't show the video because we don't know it, but this is what she said. There was a lady who pushed her way forward into the concert venue, into the first row, and started mess messing with another lady and told us we were all going to die tonight. The reporter says, do you know why she was saying that? Was this after the shots were fired? And Brianna says, it was about 45 minutes before the shots were actually fired, but then she was escorted out by... It was about 45 minutes before the shots were actually fired. It's a week after the FBI released documents on the 1 October shooter, letters sent to him prior to the 2017 massacre suggest that he discuss his plan with ex-friend and ex-convict Jim Nixon. Sasha Loftus went through the documents tonight, joining us live in studio with our top story. Brian, these letters, which are dated the between 2013 and 2017 suggests that Stephen Paddock shared plans to hurt others. His friend begging him to get help a few months before the shooting, now warning some may find this information disturbing. Just over a week after the FBI released more documents about the 1 October shooter, we have another look at what happened months before Stephen Paddock killed 58 people and hurt hundreds more at the Route 91 Harvest Festival in 2017. These letters between Paddock and ex-convict Jim Nixon, who refers to the two as friends, also shares his concern. In one dated May 27, 2017, Nixon says Paddock, quote, sounded like a madman on the phone. He then says he believes Paddock is going to commit a shooting, writing, please don't go out shooting or hurting innocent people who did nothing to you. In another passage, Nixon goes on to say Paddock should turn himself in for, quote, the murder he told him he committed in 2012. 
Nixon then says, are you telling me the truth? Did you really kill a person for practice? Several other letters include Nixon begging Paddock to not go on a shooting rampage, with one saying, what kind of killing are you going to do, and why concerts? Nixon also makes many references to Paddock's weapons, saying he has been buying them like a, quote, four-star general who is about to start a war. Several letters also ending with him asking Paddock to please get help and, quote, tell him his plans and talk to someone. Now, you'll remember two people also died from their shooting injuries at a later time. We have more in the letters and the report released by the FBI. Strange circumstances continue to swirl around the Las Vegas shooting four months ago. Here's the latest. The Clark County coroner has refused to release the autopsies of 58 shooting victims in response to a court order. It did release them, but it for, refused for some reason to release the autopsy of shooter Stephen Paddock. The coroner claims the autopsy is still being finalized even after all this time. Dr. Michael Bodden is a forensic pathologist and he joins us tonight. Doctor, this seems like a very weird explanation, or maybe it's not. You've got perspective. Tell us. Well, coroners and medical examiners have always got to obey uh, judicial orders, period. Uh, it may be in a situation where the autopsy findings may be important in a criminal investigation that the, uh, the district attorney, or in this case the FBI, asks to hold off the release so it doesn't interfere with their investigation. But that sounds very unlikely in this situation. Well, I mean, they're saying this was a single shooting event and they haven't suggested there's anything outlandish that we don't know about so what could possibly be the connection between the autopsy results and the continuing investigation that's just, that's confusing that uh, sounds like the, especially when the body has been cremated as I understand so that uh, I can't think of a reason under these circumstances where uh, all the other uh, autopsies have been released as a result of the judicial right. order, the court order, uh, why this one wouldn't be. What would we learn, do you think, of interest from an autopsy? Well, it's interesting when you have 58 people die, visually seen to have been uh, shot, why do autopsies at all? Well, right. one of the reasons is uh, to recover all the bullets that have been fired and to find if there's a bullet that came from a weapon that wasn't in the possession of the shooter. To yes. see if there was a second shooter, possibly, would be one of the reasons. The bullet we leave behind is the bullet that comes from a different gun. Uh, so that's one of the reasons for the autopsy. Right. Uh, it's horrifying video from the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. And we're learning more about the man who shot from a hotel window, killing 58 people and wounding hundreds at an outdoor music festival in Las Vegas. He is Stephen Paddock of Mesquite, Nevada. His brother says he was a multimillionaire. One was critical, but he's stable. And one of my officers was off duty attending the concert and lost his life. Can you give any more details about the firearms that were found? I don't have any more details on the firearms. All we know is they, they were rifles, and that's all I know at this point. Uh, we're executing a search warrant on the room as we speak. Sir, how are you doing? These are your guys that were out here. We're holding up, and um, we're going to do the best we can. Uh, and I don't want to say that's what we're paid to do, It's because uh, nobody's paid to do what we're experiencing right now. Um, but the, in my preview of the police department, they're doing a fantastic job, and we're going to have to look out for their well-being moving forward. Uh, we have officers at his uh, residence, uh, and we'll be uh, executing a search warrant there also shortly. How does the city recover from this? That's a hard question to answer at this point. Um, it's too early in the process, and please give us time so we can do a good job. My name is Doug Papa. I'm a former law enforcement officer, criminal investigator. I worked in the casino business for 20 years. I write part-time for the Baltimore Post Examiner. I received some information from a former police official from Metro who told me that initially the homicide investigators were investigating the shooting because homicide, 58 people were dead and Paddock allegedly committed suicide. That would be something that homicide would investigate. It was taken away from the homicide bureau and given to a team called the Force Investigating Team. Well, the woman in charge of FIT is Captain Kelly McMahill, who was the wife 
of the second in command at the LVMPD under Sheriff Kevin McMahill. And that man has a very shady past. Early in his career, he was part of a squad that found a woman with drugs on her and told her they'd let her off if she showed them her vagina. They went to court, there was a payout, he left the LVMPD, but then he came back and now he's risen all the way up to number two. If her husband is the number two guy in Metro and she's a bureau commander and now she's investigating the worst mass shooting in U.S. history, it just seems to me a little concerning. And the interesting thing about Captain Kelly McMahill is she's actually never investigated a homicide and yet she's being put in charge of the biggest case in Vegas over the last decade, even though she has no experience? Why? Maybe if something needs to be concealed or not brought out and your wife's controlling that bureau, it just looks a little bit suspicious. This is the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. I want answered why was it taken away from homicide and given it to a unit that only investigates use of force by police officers. The press was completely unaware that the homicide unit had been moved off the case until Doug Papa broke a story on it. The LVMPD wasn't in a hurry for the world to find this out and didn't seem real thrilled with Doug Papa or his story. After the article was published in the Baltimore Examiner, Captain Coverup was quickly transferred off the case. And Doug Papa got an email from LVMPD Detective David Gorris. He wanted to know where Doug got his information. Still 40 hours after this massacre, there is still no word on the motive, but for the first time today, police are saying they will find one. And we are now learning a lot more about what was happening before and during the attack inside that hotel room. I assure you this investigation is not ended. Uh, with the demise of Mr. Paddock. These new images of Paddock's hotel suite with weapons on the floor were taken in the aftermath of the shooting. Investigators are continuing their work there. There was cameras located um, in outside of the room and inside of the room, uh, along with the firearms. I anticipate he was looking for anybody coming uh, to take him into custody. Federal law enforcement officials also tell Fox News that Paddock, a heavy gambler, sent tens of thousands of dollars overseas in advance advance of the attack, possibly to his girlfriend. I can't tell you her current whereabouts right now. All I know is the Philippines. Currently, she's a person of interest. Leaving the White House today for hurricane-ravaged Puerto Rico, President Trump briefly shared his reaction to the massacre with reporters. But I do have to say, how quickly the police department was able to get in was really very much of a miracle. They've done an amazing job. He was a sick man, a demented man. A lot of problems, I guess, and uh, we're looking into him very, very seriously, but we're dealing with a very, very sick individual. Authorities continue to say the massacre was planned well in advance. Amateur video provided by two men who stayed in the same room from where Paddock rained down his terror shows the clear view he had of the concert venue. No religious affiliation, no political affiliation, no, he, he just hung out. And no history of mental illness. Not a bit. Authorities are asking for blood donations and say it will take time to identify all the dead and injured. Investigators say Paddock killed himself before SWAT teams stormed the hotel room. They also say they recovered 19 weapons in the room and he used a hammer-like device to smash the windows to shoot through the windows to the crowd down below. Live in Las Vegas. The warning signs that are missed, you're going to have a lot of people trying to put together uh, information about this guy who knew about him, what he was thinking, whether he was talking to anyone about this planned attack. Were some of those warning signs missed and what does it all mean to security expert Paul Violas? Uh, Paul, what do you think? What is the first thing you want to start pursuing here? I want to, but now that they have executed the search warrant, Neil, I want to look at his computer, his laptop, his phone. I want to see who he called, when he called them, how long he stayed on the phone with them. I want to know the websites that he visited. Every piece of his history with respect to recent communications are going to be vital. The next part, remember, this is a layered investigation. So you have two crime scenes. You have where the shooter was inside the Mandalay Bay, and then you have the, the actual concert area. So they've got to work those crime scenes. They have so many people that they're going to have to interview in order to collect information. 
And then the last part of that, the tertiary part of the investigation, will come when they start interviewing neighbors, friends, where he went to a gun range, of things that he had said. Things but he wouldn't have to necessarily be a sharpshooter or even a great shot, right, to, to, to be effective at this. He wouldn't have to be a great shot, because yeah. he was smart enough to know the weapons to choose, the long guns he had, the ammunition that was going to fulfill what he... What, he what did you make of it? This is the third day of this country concert. Right. So he arrived presumably last Thursday. Right. We don't know how long it took him to get all that weaponry up there. I assume he did in stages, maybe not, but... Um, he was patient, took his time. Yeah, what do you make of that? Well planned. There's no question about it. Remember, when he checked in, Neil, he had to ask for a room that was overlooking the concert area. So he selected the room exactly where he wanted, and he wanted it on a certain floor for the trajectory of shooting down. So to be so this that venue, watch this concert venue, and the 20,000 plus that were there, some say it attracted more than 40,000, so we don't have the reliable numbers, but that was by design. No question about that. He was looking for maximum impact, and that's what he got. And, and kudos to Las Vegas PD, Neil, because if they didn't respond as expeditiously as they did, there'd be a lot more than people right now. Um, we don't know how long the whole thing lasted. Uh, right. I've heard anywhere a few minutes to 12 minutes. Now learning that Las Vegas shooter Stephen Paddock concealed his deadly arsenal by hanging a Do Not Disturb sign on his hotel room door for three days. According to hotel policy, a maid cannot enter a room at the Mandalay Bay with a Do Not Disturb sign unless somebody from security is present. Don Aviv is an expert on hotel security. If he put his do not disturb sign on the door, they would not have bothered them. They may have knocked on the door, they may have called, they may have checked in with him, and he would have answered. He would have said, no, I'm fine, I don't need a new towels or sheets, and that's it. They would have left him alone. Paddock smuggled 23 guns into his room in 10 pieces of luggage. He may have brought the bags in a few at a time to avoid arousing suspicion. Think about all the trips that people take to Las Vegas, the bags they bring, the golf trips, the weddings, the movie shoots that happen in these hotels. So simply bag by bag over a three day period. Here's Jim Murray. From up here at this vantage point, it's stunning just how far away that concert venue seems. Yet, how much damage and destruction the gunman was able to achieve from such a distance. So, Mark, look, I'm not a conspiracy nut at all, and I'm desperately hoping the authorities will prevent me from forming my own conspiracies to explain what is becoming increasingly inexplicable. But it looks like that interview you just saw, and I'm putting air quotes around the word interview, was managed by MGM, and that's why they put him on Ellen's show. Does that give you confidence that the public, which has a right to understand what happened, is learning anything meaningful about this story? No, and I'm not a conspiracy nut either, uh, but you're entitled to be one on this, Tucker, because uh, whether by intention or design, nothing is proceeding normally in this case, yes. up to the absurdity where someone says, I'm only going to give one interview uh, and uh, I'm going to give it to Ellen DeGeneres. And Ellen... <laughs> exactly. Ellen and I've got nothing against. I've got nothing against. I've got nothing against Ellen. I, I don't that's, either. That's, that. Uh, I, uh, but this, but it's, it seems very uh, weird choice. And as you say, uh, she, she manages to say, well, you are a true hero uh, because by getting shot in the leg, you saved so many lives. That's not what happened. That was the old narrative. Uh, no, uh, the old exactly. Narr the old narrative was that he interrupted the, the gunfire, took a shot in the leg, and brought the massacre to a halt. And then the sheriff said, oh, no, no, no. Sorry, is that what I said? No, absolutely sorry. I got things the wrong way round. Actually, uh, Mr. Campos got there before the mass shooting started, and then uh, apparently the shooter took, be between shooting Mr. Campos in the leg, there was then a six-minute delay before he started massacring everybody, uh, during which time he had a nice cup of tea or called down to room service or whatever he did, and then the hotel said, no, no, that's not what happened. There's a third timeline, and then uh, everybody does the obvious and says, well, why don't we ask Mr. Campos what happened? And then they say suddenly, oh no, he's disappeared. He's gone now. He's off the scene. No one's seen him for a week. And then he comes back and he's on the Ellen DeGeneres show. And uh, that's how conspiracy theories start. And everybody is entitled to take a flyer on whatever conspiracy theory they want. 
in this case because for whatever reason, officialdom and Mandalay Bay and the Ellen DeGeneres show have muddied the waters to total impenetrability now. Well, that's exactly, I think it's so nicely put because it's clear. And by the way, simply because MGM managed this interview doesn't mean that it's inaccurate or that, you know, I'm not attacking MGM. But I also think it was managed. Clearly, it was managed. Right. And so that, and they're under a ton of legal pressure because the usual ambulance chasers are circling the hotel looking for payouts. And so that suggests that, like, he's under a lot of pressure to give a specific storyline that may not be that useful in understanding what actually happened. Well, but, but there's other issues here, Tucker, because Las Vegas is one of the most surveilled cities on Earth. Yes. Because all these big casino resort owners want to know what people are doing in the building from every conceivable angle. So even before we got the big panopticon post-9-11 security state, uh, in Vegas they had cameras everywhere linked to some uh, back office where everybody's looking at what you're doing. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that if, say, uh, there's some terrorist thing that goes on in London or Paris or Brussels or wherever, within a couple of, the Brussels airport bombing is a very good thing. These guys pull some stunt at the Brussels airport, kill a bunch of people. Within 24 hours, you've got the closed circuit television picture showing the killer moving through the airport concourse. Here, Mandalay Bay has not released any footage uh, any shots of this guy, the couple of pictures even of the hotel room door are all uh, are actually extremely limited. If 200 yes. rounds did indeed come through this door, that must be the best built hotel room door in the history of hotel <laughs> rooms. That's exactly uh, right. And, and, and so, uh, obviously, I might be wrong. There might be an explanation for that. Uh, the, the bullet, he might not have been a very good shot, so he was actually uh, firing through the, uh, the, the cheap sheetrock to the side of the door. I don't know. But the fact is that Mandalay Bay has not done what Brussels Airport did in that terrorist attack. No, and so it's, nobody it's totally actually right. knows what this guy was doing. There's this really is one for the textbooks. We've seen older white males in their 40s and 50s committing mass murder. But 60s is highly unusual. Movie Criminologist Dr. Casey Jordan told me that the reports that Paddock was gambling $10,000 a day before the massacre may be a clue. In our experience in criminology with killers like this, mass murderers, it's usually an event of power and control. Like It would mean some triggering event like total financial loss or bankruptcy. Maybe the total breakup of a relationship, a diagnosis of terminal illness. Um, something else very interesting, I believe you brought this to our attention. Um, um, the MGM CEO, his name's Jim Murren, uh, the weeks leading up to the attack, he sold a ton of stock. Um, that's always suspicious when things of this nature happen. Why would he be doing that? I'm sure there's a normal reason, don't you think? I, I think that there is a normal reason, but talk about giving uh, giving fodder for the conspiracy theorists. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you couldn't ask for anything better. Let's just feed the sharks here with that. Um, yeah. I'm sure that there's a legitimate reason. Uh, maybe he had to ba buy the baby new shoes or something, but um, <laughs> some expensive he, uh, he, he shoes. He made a lot of money on the deal. I know. You know, that's like when people dump stock right before 9/11 in some industries that was very suspicious. But you know, right. it just leaves a lot of questions out there. Uh, one of the other things I think a lot of people really honed on to right at the jump was the ISIS affiliation. ISIS immediately taking credit for the attack, saying that this guy converted six months before. Now we see he may have taken some cruises to some Middle East locations. Do you believe there's any ISIS connection now? I don't think there's been any anything that, that uh, says that there's been an ISIS connection. Uh, ISIS is uh, they're a bunch of leeches. I mean, talk about talk about people who, who uh, are, are sucking up for PR. That's them. I mean, any any some, somebody could get killed in uh, in in Oshkosh and they're going to take credit for it. Okay. So th I th I think it's a bunch of, of garbage. Okay. And the police are still doing the forensic investigation into the guy's computers. So we don't right. have that information yet. But so far it does. Now look, they found any ISIS connection. Um, one of the things that interests me 
There has been talk about accomplices. There has been talk about second shooters, and people all over the internet say they saw second shooters. If you look at the video, and now we're hearing about this man Paddock employing prostitutes in the days before the attack. Do you see any involvement of any other person, including the wife or the girlfriend or whoever, that draws your attention? Not at all. Um, now, what, the one thing that's interesting about the prostitution angle is that um, a prostitute that came forward said that this guy had violent rape fantasies and considered himself evil. I actually think that that may be more significant than, uh, than it is being uh, held out to the public because that does show a, a, a very odd personality kind of uh, you know thing going on. So, But I do not think that there was any shooters. I Personally, I've gotten some crazy, crazy messages and emails accusing me of being an accomplice. You know, poker has been called the crack cocaine of gambling. Paddock would sit for hours at machines here at Mandalay Bay. He was focused and methodical. His fingers worked furiously as he played as many as 100 games an hour. Former professional gambler Anthony Curtis. He was absolutely a high-level video poker player in terms of the amount that he spent, the amount that he wagered. His skill level appears to be fairly high. Video poker is a game where you can do better than the guy next to you if you understand strategy. Paddock was such a high roller, the luxury suite where he launched his shooting spree was comped by the hotel. Last May, Paddock invited his brother Eric and a nephew to a free weekend at the Wynn Hotel where he had chairman's club status. They feasted on sushi dinners and saw a show all comped. He's a guy who lived in a house in Mesquite down and gambled in Las Vegas. Forensic psychiatrist Dr. Keith After Ablow. All, this is somebody who moved close to Las Vegas. Why? To play video games. Okay? Now it happened to be video poker, but it's still video games and most folks aren't moving to a city in order to play obsessively video games. I'm a very straightforward guy. You know that. If he had told me that I just needed to come pick up the ashes, I would have just come and picked up the ashes. I'd still be scratching my head why it cost me 1500 bucks that I had to fly out of here instead of $157 to ship them in the U.S. And again, what did I do when I found out that the coroner was not executing? I got on a plane and came here and, and did the job. That's what I do. Okay? This was, this was a no-brainer. I could have done this the day the... The day the ashes were created, I could have done this. I don't understand why he wanted to play games. I mean, this is a thing that has to be done when someone dies. That's all this is. And if it had just been handled that way, it would have been and done a month ago. So, again, this is just silliness. I did notice a, uh, a note on the nightstand near his shooting platform, I could see on it he had written the distance, the, the elevation he was on, the drop of what his bullet was going to be for those for the crowd. So he had had that written down and figured out so he would know where to shoot to hit his targets from there. What were the numbers? I'm just trying to hear that. He, he, he had done calculations or he... Yeah, he had written. He must have done the calculations or gone online or something to figure it out of what his altitude was going to be on how high up he was, how far out the crowd was going to be, and what it, at that distance, what his drop of his bullet was going to be. The timeline, very confusing. The timeline has now changed three times. The security right. guard uh, was shot allegedly before beforehand, then it was afterwards, then he called, and you know, he didn't call. Then the security guard was supposed to do these interviews, and then bailed, and no one can find him. What's going on here? <laughs> Well, I, I, there's, a, there's, a, I think that he was told to shut the hell up. I, yeah. That's what I think. I think that he was uh, getting ready to come to the, uh, to this studio to do his thing, and he was suddenly spirited away by uh, lawyers. Uh, shall we say, pe probably? I would, th I would think so. And, and so I, I don't think it's going to be mysterious. I think that, uh, that it was a business decision, mm -hmm. if you will. And so I, I think that's the reality. Yeah, because someone at the MGM or Mandalay Bay has got to be up all night figuring out how much money they're going to have to pay out in settlements. Boots he was wearing would mean so much. It was hours into the concert when he said he heard the bullets. It's fireworks or something. We didn't think it was real. But then he realized he was hurt, shot in the leg. And I'm hit, run, and I just 
took off and started running. When he made it out of the venue, he says he sat on a curb and a stranger took off his boots to help bandage him up. It was pretty, pretty amazing to see how many people were helping out all those people sitting on the curb. He's now home from the hospital, limping but okay. And on social media, he saw a picture of the boots he left behind, a photo taken by the Las Vegas Sun that's now gone viral. That's that curb I was sitting at. You can see kind of the bandages that people used to wrap me up. And, um, like, yeah, those are definitely my boots. He says they're a symbol that he survived, knowing so many others didn't, including his South Torrance High classmate, Christiana Duarte. We were all were praying for her and hoping she got found, but, you know, we heard worse news. Stephen hasn't taken off his concert wristband, still spattered with blood, and hopes to find his cowboy boots not good memories, but evidence of hope. And remembrance of all the people there and, you know, the fact that I was able to make it out alive.